Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our third webinar in our Clean Water Champions webinar series uh, on caring for our waterways. We are very excited to have uh, three guest speakers joining us tonight. Uh, Randall W. Lewis, Sadie Karen, and Dave Scott. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, where I, where this is being broadcast, where I am right now um, in Vancouver. Uh, these are the unceded uh, traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Really important for us to uh, be put, making this acknowledgement, especially when we are talking about our waterways and caring for them as uh, Indigenous people have uh, a long history of having taken care of this land uh, that we are um, you know, visitors uh, to. And uh, I'd like to let you know that our next webinar, we are inviting uh, three Indigenous uh, speakers uh, to talk about uh, connection to water and in uh, integrating Indigenous perspectives. I'll let you know a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, so if you'd like to make an acknowledgement yourself, please do uh, welcome to pop down in the chat or just where you're joining from. I'd like to introduce you to C-Smart if you haven't heard about us. I see there's actually quite a, a few new faces in the audience. Uh, welcome if this is uh, your first time interacting with us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you've been to our previous webinars before or have uh, engaged with C-Smart in the past, welcome back. Uh, thank you for your continued support. It's really wonderful to, to have all of you here. We are a charity. Uh, we uh, teach environmental education with a focus on inspiring youth uh, to love and protect our oceans. We focus a lot on youth, but we also do adult programs. But our youth programs, we uh, next month, July, we're starting our summer camps. We are so excited. They're all outdoors, kids beach, getting kids connected to nature, getting them interested in science, and uh, loving um, that place, feeling that place-based learning to really drive that environmental message into their future. When you're connected to an area, that's when you want to protect it. But we also have online programs, especially uh, with COVID in the past year, we've been developing online courses and delivering our school workshops and after-school programs online too. So that's what it looks like when we're delivering an online program with kids. Uh, really fun and interactive. So please, please let, uh, if you know any kids, if you know any teachers in schools, let them know to bring us in in the fall. Or if you uh, have any kids in your life who are ages seven to 15, uh, please let them know to check out our Ocean Defender online self-led courses. We also do programs for adults, uh, really fun beach cleanups. We've had to put that on pause over the last year but we just found out that they have reopened and we are so excited to start planning more beach cleanups again. We do that a lot with our summer camps with kids, um, but we have a lot of fun uh, doing these with adults too. We collect a lot more trash when we have uh, adults around, but we also do lunch and learns uh, and we're doing those virtually now too. We have this big challenge uh, that's happening over the summer. What's great is that it uh, can be done all remotely, virtually. Um, it's a package that you download. It has a list of challenges that you can do out in uh, local beaches or waterways. It is Vancouver specific because we have 30 challenges plus 10 that are Vancouver specific. But if you're joining from somewhere else, uh, you can still go download that package and the challenges there will still be a lot of fun wherever you're joining from. As I was mentioning earlier, we have our final workshop in our Clean Water Champions webinar series. That one is on connection to water. Uh, we have three wonderful guest speakers joining us for that one too. Tasha Beads, Morgan Garen, and Mar Marilyn Baptist. I'm really excited um, as uh, we have Tasha as a water walker um, and Marilyn who's a uh, previous uh, chief and uh, she was uh, leading a project to that resisted a mining company from uh, draining their local lake. I'm really excited to learn all about that from them. So please take a look at this. I'll also pop these links in the chat afterwards. Uh, but what you're here for today is our webinar on caring for our waterways. And we will have our first guest speaker tonight is Randall Lewis. 
Um, Randall, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Randall was the environmental coordinator with the Squamish Nation. Uh, he helped form the Squamish River Watershed Society in 1998. He was president until very recently, um, moved down to vice presidency for to, to give other people a bit of a chance to, to take on the, that, that leadership role. Randall's really passionate about environmental protection and habitat improvement for salmon. Um, his other passion is education and outreach. So he started the Squamish Valley, Nation Valley PAC, uh, Parent Association. Um, he's the current chair of the education community group, and he supports educational awareness with First Nation youth through Cultural Journeys School. Mm -hmm. Randall was also part of team uh, who won the Harvard Award uh, for their transboundary mandate with USA, uh, where 22 tribes and 56 First Nations signed a statement of co cooperation. So please join me in welcoming Randall. Thank you so much for being with here with us tonight. Thank you. So um, is my 12 minutes starting now? Your 12 minutes is on, timing you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, my ancestral name is uh, It comes from my great, great grandmother, Martha Chlechlia. Uh, she was married to my great, great grandfather, Zotacho, um, or um, Captain Louis. He, uh, they lived in Chuck Chuck in the Upper Squamish, Ilahu Valley in Poam. We had, they had long houses there, but for contact, we were semi-nomadic. Uh, we spent the, the, we went up there and um, they went up there in September uh, or, or maybe October from Sanok. And Sanok is over in uh, Kitsilino where the Broad Street Bridge is. Uh, that's Sanok there where they call Kitsilino today. That long houses there where the Molson Brewery is. That's where they had their long houses before contact. So they moved back and forth. We also had um, long houses in Stottmas. Uh, we have carbon dated artifacts in Stawamas, 4,500 years old. Artifacts in the Upper Squamish, Ilaho Valley, 3,000 years old. Um, the other areas where we occupied with Huehue. Huehue is Lumberman's Arch, where Stanley Park is right now. That's Lumber Majority, that's Huehue. We had long, uh, very large long houses there too. Of course, among other um, Squamish nation uh, clans, um, we're a wolf clan, uh, we were a warrior clan. Uh, we did our best not to war, did not want to war, but when the push came to shove, we were the ones that had to take care of that business, unfortunately. Um, but also, uh, um, so with that, we, I guess the point being, we've been here a long time, uh, carbon dating these artifacts and, um, within our respective territory here, it's Kholmish, uh, Wolf Clan. We're also of the Thunderbird Clan. There's a pictograph of a Thunderbird found on the Ilahu Valley, a, a pictograph on a, a, a cave wall. And it's high up in the mountain where the Ilahu Valley is, uh, Ilahu and the Upper Squamish, it was a lookout point. There we have um, uh, found a, a, a Thunderbird painting. And it's up, up in near where Mount Cayley is in the Upper Squamish, that extinct volcano up there in that neck of the woods. And we say that's where the Thunderbirds landed. Um, the, mention, the reason I mentioned the, um, uh, uh, the carbon date of artifacts in our territory, we must have been doing something right for thousands of years where the species and abundance were in the billions. We had billions of Ulagan going up the Malcolm, the Chequemish, and Upper Squamish spawning and coming down. Uh, in, in House Sound, we know we have two species of, uh, of herring now. We have a domestic herring that stay in House Sound and the herring that migrate in and out and spawn. Uh, elders of the day, when I spoke to as a young boy who were 99 years old or 102 years old, talked about birds that were five miles long and three miles wide, literally blotted out the sun. So that kind of abundance, uh, within our respective territory. When we had potlatches, we needed to maintain our sacred oath to the blessings that today is colonization called commodities or natural resources. Elders of the day of the past were offended when they heard natural resources or the commodities because these are our blessings and our sacred oath was to return threefold of whatever we harvest for future generations, the next seven generations. So that was our sacred oath. Um, our potlatches were um, 
uh, very significant and we need to maintain uh, the abundance levels of the species in our respective territories. When we held the potlatch, there are two to 3,000 First Nations as far as uh, Alaska and California came here participating. We needed to, we had to hear every song, respect every person who came here with a story and a song. That also included puberty rights of our children, our children's puberty rights coming from young children into young adulthood. And then when they went into adulthood, received other, other names. Uh, and we all shared this collectively and collaboratively with other First Nations we used to potlatch with. And that's how we met my father and ancestors met their wives because uh, my, my late mother is Nachana from Port Alberni, you know, Chakosit, Apachisit, Ahawasit, Tofino. Those are the tribes over there my mom's from. So I come from a warrior clan over there, also a warrior clan here uh, in Squamish. But we also had um, 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 ancestors who were uh, uh, shamans or Indian doctors and doctors of healers, understanding the ethnobotany traditional plants that I was taught as a young boy, all the ethnobotany medicinal plants within the repairing areas, within the forest or within the mountains. A lot of these plants are extinct now. Can't find them anywhere because of the uh, historic um, forestry. So um, subject to salmon in our territory um, and the abundance levels that used to be before contact and what they are today, we're on the, um, the final uh, step uh, of species at risk and endangered the species of, of, of our five uh, Andronibus salmon within our watershed, the Chinook, the Coho, the Chum, the Pinks. Every now and then we get sockeye salmon here in our watersheds. Our ancestors or elders of the day said, we used to have sockeye here before, but not anymore. But I participated and worked on our Squamish Nation salmon enumeration from 1992 to um, when they retired me, uh, April um, 11th, uh, 2019. Um, in those, we, and we've done a DNA curricular punches of all the species that we did the enumeration on. And we, and we have that information with Joe Teddy at Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And we've done some work in the DNA with the Chinook salmon, find out how, who they're related to in the coast. And it's very interesting information, um, uh, information with regards to how um, our salmon species are related to other salmon species in the Washington state watersheds right up to uh, Campbell River uh, up there, how our Chinook's related to them. The sockeye we found here were interesting because I was wondering, why are they here? Why, why do we find the bunch of levels of 150 to 200 in Mancombe, sometimes two to 300 in, in the Chequem at certain times of the year? So what I did, I looked at the Fraser River um, temperatures of the day when we found those species here and historic temperatures of the sockeye and the Fraser River. When we found that the river was running at 23 Celsius or 20 Celsius, that's when we found sockeye in our watershed. They said, we're not going to swim through this jacuzzi. We're going to go somewhere else. So when I found the elevated levels, high levels in the Fraser, and that's because we had the, the snow melt and fresh shut happening four months early, three months early. It's happened. And when, the, when that's fresh, it's happened. It's over. It was sockeye returning and low levels of the river. And they're running into warm waters. And that's when we're finding sockeye in our systems up here. Uh, when the Fraser's is running warm. And that, that's what I found through um, checking out the, those uh, temperatures, the rivers within our territory in the Fraser River. Um, the um, salmon we have here, um, the coho were at risk at one time and we made a commitment to deal with the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans years ago around um, 1990, 91, where the coho numbers had crashed and become extinct. So. I told DFO when I met with them, you need to come to our community. You need to talk to our elders and community. Um, DFO is very, very afraid to come to our communities because of historic enforcement. My father, went, I'm just, just so you know, I'm um, Oops, sorry, Randall, we muted you for some uh, apologies. You just have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, I'm in the middle of 14 brothers and sisters, um, and big family. My late father was the youngest of uh, 15 brothers and sisters. We've had big families. And I asked my late mother and, uh, and other elders, why do we have, why were we having so, such big families? They said, because of the epidemics of the past, our numbers, we were having 10, 15 kids, sometimes zero would survive. 
and maybe one or two would survive in these big numbers. And that's why we're having such big families at, at that day and time, uh, because the epidemics of the past, uh, smallpox, influenza, whatever it was, were wiping our people out. So we had big numbers, maybe one or two or zero would survive. My grandfather and his brother were the youngest um, uh, in the 1800s that survived those epidemics. He had eight older siblings that perished in those epidemics of the past. We're estimated anywhere around 30,000 at one time. We went down to less than 200 complete genocide of tribes of the past. My name comes from a tribe that, because we're intermarried with them, from the um, Chuck Chuck and Poyam and Squamish, my name Ta'achtin comes from a, a tribe that became extinct, but because we're blood married and we're the, and when the last ones perished and died, they said to our ancestors, I'm the last one of who we are. Keep our names alive, and you can keep you, and you can have our lands and that territory where we're from, type of thing, right? So, uh, and my name comes from my grandmother. So, when we look at salmon um, in our territory and the history of it, uh, and uh, historical impacts from industrialization of uh, Britannia Beach, you know, um, that legacy is finally cleaned up to a point where. There's actually salmon uh, we found uh, going into Britannia Beach again, and that's very exciting. Wood fiber, um, port melon, and the past FMC chloroalkyl plant that was creating the ferrins and the oxygen to white the paper that were going into these mills, and they were just flushing all these toxins and toxic uh, deleterious materials into House Sound. House Sound was a very toxic toilet bowl, and we were told not to eat the uh, the shellfish or clams or anything anymore. Uh, and I found reports um, in 1978 where there were 17 parts per million of ferrins and dioxins in young Chinook salmon in House Sound in 1978. DFO never, never, didn't say anything that to us. They were dumping 40 tons of mercury a year into House Sound, arsenic, everything, ferrins and dioxins. That's why it was a toxin. So, uh, when I got, I did a term, which they hired me in 1992 to be environmental uh, uh, coordinator. Um, in 1993, I got on chief and council. They said, you should run for council and all these recommendations, things you the council, they have a hard time understanding it. If you're on council, you can run the mandate yourself when you're on council. So I ran for council, got lucky, got in. So I did a four year term from 93 to 96. Within that first year of my term of council, um, I sued DFO, I sued um, uh, BC Ministry of Environment and others because I didn't want to go through a long bureaucratic process with them trying to justify their legislative mandates and permits they've given out for people to pollute our waters and pollute our salmon and pollute the repairing areas of our, of our watershed. So it was a shotgun approach. I just sued everybody in government of the past. That triggered uh, the the courts ruling in our favor because I wasn't going to start a, or a litigate anything without a understanding that we had a chance to win. We won all our court cases, of course, and that brought um, DFO, uh, Environment Canada, um, BC Ministry of Environment, uh, and such to the table um, when we won these court cases. And that triggered some real meaningful due diligence over and above the, the legislative mandates and policies of the day because they're very woefully inadequate. They're given permits to pollute. They're justifying uh, and legitimizing um, to pollute the rivers, building dams, building independent power plants. But the FMC Coracoli plant site was a big issue. And I had to sue the Crown for that one to get some real major due diligence on that one. Because we, through the studies and, and experts I hired uh, to work for the nation, we did sediment sampling and drilled down to find out how deep the, uh, the down the mercury was and, and other deleterious substances in the Malcolm Blind Channel and House Island and elsewhere. And we found that certain levels, it's capped by the Squamish River sediment uh, loading. And we know now in certain areas, we can't dig down any deeper than this or we're gonna release the mercury again and release all these substance, deleterious substances again in the columns of water. And that's a big issue. So that's corporate knowledge and knowledge reports that I have that's in my head. Existing um, political will of the day don't know this. And that's very concerning. So that's why I've been working very hard uh, with education of the past with our youth and creating um, opportunities through um, 
creating the parent pack in 1998. Uh, create, we have an elementary school curriculum up here with the elementary schools up in Squamish here. And we have Rhonda uh, O'Grady. Um, she works with our uh, Watershed Society and, and she's just a whirlwind uh, personality that w works at the Stormish Elementary School. But we do watersheds uh, management and things throughout our territory. We've done a lot of habitat restoration in the Brown site and um, the Squamish Estuary Brown site, there used to be the old West Boy log site. We restored that uh, into estuary. The logging road that was going down there took the logging road right out and, made, and did estuary management uh, rehabilitation there. Worked with the province, District of Squamish, federal government, but we created and got all the funds to do that through the Watershed Society. Within two years, we raised over $600,000. We did ask anybody for money. We went and found the money, had all the plans made out, and I already had and created um, the appropriate uh, time frame of due diligence with Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Environment Canada, BC Parks, District of Squamish. Everybody was on, on board, thumbs up, and ready to go. So we did some phenomenal work in the estuary, but also our watersheds uh, in the, um, the Marincombe watershed, Chiakamish watershed, uh, Upper Squamish, Elaho, um, Shovel Nose, uh, Last year, we just finally completed um, dynamiting out what we call the, the wash barrel. Lava flows came down uh, and blocked part way to the other side, west side of the Squamish River and the upper Squamish. That was causing a fire hose effect where the fish couldn't get past there. So we blasted that out in the last two years. Previous to that, we blew out in the 1970s. They were building logging roads uh, on the Upper Squamish in the 1970s, late 1960s. The Elahu Valley, they were blasting around the mountain, building logging roads. They blew a big chunk of mountain off that came off as a result of a major blast, rolled down the river and blocked the river. This major size boulder was over three stories high and two stories wide, blocking the Elahu River. We had villages up there of the past from my ancestors, and this is how I explained it to the province. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans had been trying to convince the province for 20 years to do this work. The province was saying no. There's a fellow who works as a grizzly bear biologist up here in Squamish, um, Steve Rochetta. He contacted me and he works with the province, uh, but he agreed with the work said work that was required. He said, you guys have been at this for 20 years. I'm gonna contact Ryan Lewis of the Squamish Nation. He'll have this settled in two weeks. So he contacted me, we had a meeting. I asked him who in the province was doing this at the time. He told me who the person was, it was a regional manager uh, of, the, of the province. And um, once I found out who he was, did some research on him. The minister of the day was Barry Penner. I called the minister responsible of the day, Barry Penner. I said, we have to have a meeting. We're gonna have a meeting and this is what we're gonna do. So we had the meeting and I told them, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, this is what you need to do. I have writs ready to go. I've already sued the crown in certain areas and one, this is a slam dunk. We can do this in 15 minutes or we can do it in five years. And he says, what's 15 minutes? Agree with me uh, and we'll get it done. But we'll do proactively together. We'll build partnerships in doing it. He said, no then we file a writ, we're in court for five years and arguing rights and title and we're gonna win and you're gonna to be totally embarrassed. So what do you wanna do? So I like the 15 minutes, Randy. So great, so let's do it in 15 minutes. So we did, we already had a plan. We had all the benthic surveys and all the work already done. Put it in front of him, this is what it is. Um, uh, and then we wanna create a relationship with you, the province, and this is what it's gonna be. And strategically and structurally, this is how it's gonna work. First thing, number one, you need to get rid of this regional person, send them somewhere else, promote them or do whatever, but you need to kick this guy to the curb, put somebody else in place for me to deal with. Because I had a couple confrontations with him already. He needs to leave. So they sent him somewhere else, put another person in place. And uh, from there, I realized after some discussions and information, and my historic rights information for me, my clan, we don't share that with them because we're 16 tribes that amalgamated um, July 23rd, 1923, 16 tribes. We're one of those tribes up here. And I have my own oral knowledge. We speak a very ancient dialect of our language. And my name and, um, was explained to me by uh, one of our um, uh, Cockleton Siam's mother. She was 99 years old at the time. 
And when my father gave him that name, she, she was in shock because she hadn't heard that name in 70 years. And she said that um, it brings libraries of information back to her, but it means high spirit of the land is what that, of what that often means. Um, but subject to being high spirit of the land, uh, if it's meaning, it brings a lot of connections uh, of all the species that sustained us for thousands of years. She said, when we say all our relations, all the relations means we're related to everything. Every biological thing, rock, trees, slugs, whatever it is in our territory, oceans, water, all the relations means we're related to them, we're connected to them. And, and that's what, basically what that means. So when we talk about the fisheries uh, and we talk about past, before contact, contact and post contact, we are in big trouble. The work I've completed since, uh, and achieved since 1992 and now um, uh, is, is, is a small pulse uh, of achievements. A lot more work to be done. When I said political will of the past in the day, we really had to push that political will to, to, to make them engage meaningfully. The political will is coming around, but when you look at, at um, 2012, the Harper government pushed the nominums bill through uh, Bill C-38, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, was neutered and, and just stripped. Bill C-45 had a really major impact and significantly marginalized environment Canada. The BC, uh, um, BC uh, uh, Environmental Assessment Act was significantly marginalized by uh, Christy Clark. Why? So they could push the LNG through, so they can push through um, the, uh, uh, the, the LNG and the... the, the uh, uh, small independent power projects that we built throughout our First Nations territories. So what's happened there now uh, as a result of that, the political will is waning right now. Uh, what I suggested to Trudeau when he came in was that let's just put the Department of Fisheries and Oceans legislation back prior to 2012 and talk about those deficiencies. And we need to implement the Wild Salmon Act that, that you guys signed off on in 2005. We need to implement the Cohen Commission um, mm -hmm. work that, that with those recommendations and yeah. then was pushing those buttons with the, the federal governments of the day. But today um, there's a new, a new announcement of funding coming through the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which is good, but it, it's oh, again- it's wonderful to hear. Small steps towards achieving again, um, some meaningful dialogue with those governments, with those First Nations, with the user groups, um, Squamish Nation, I worked at and achieved before I was my four year term, we bought TFL 38. That's over 219,000 hectares of land that we control and operate. Wow. Got a 400 hectare wooden lot license in Broome Ridge, a 10,000 um, hectare um, community license agreement with Whistler. Yeah. Randall, then, it is incredible to hear all that you uh, have achieved and the groups that you've worked with, uh, I am in awe of yeah. of of you and and um, and the history, the, the the push that you've made to um, undo the damage uh, that has historically been done and help mm -hmm. us uh, restore uh, the habitats that that have been destroyed. Uh, so I, I'd like to. Um, uh, that's all the time we have tonight for, for that uh, portion of our evening, Randall. I really appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A at the end. Randall, okay. there's a few questions for you. I know other people want to ask questions, and we'll yep. save those for the Q&A. Please join me in thanking Randall. Thank Lewis. you. Thank you. Um, Randall, I especially liked how you brought up the historical abundance um, of of uh, the biodiversity of the fauna and flora. Uh, that's something that we tend to forget is uh, the shifting baselines uh, that w when, we, when we grew up and we see uh, what something is, we just expect like that's, that's the norm. But we, that's why it's so important to have this data, the scientific data, but also that historical knowledge. And I love how you have been in the interface of bridging that gap between the science as an environmental coordinator and the indigenous uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge and ways of uh, caring for our environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Randall. Next up, we have Dave Scott uh, joining us here. 
Uh, Dave is a salmon biologist uh, who focuses on understanding juvenile salmon life histories. So bouncing off of uh, Randall's work to protect salmon. So Dave is currently a PhD student in the Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Laboratory at UBC and at the University of British Columbia. And he also leads Raincoast Fraser Estuary Connectivity Project, uh, Raincoast Conservation Foundation. And this has created three large beaches, uh, breaches in the Steveson Jetty, uh, reconnecting the river to its delta after almost a hundred years, or over a hundred years. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dave Scott. Thank you, Dave, for being here tonight. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, Randall for uh, his words and uh, yeah, really touching on a lot of the issues that, that salmon are facing. Um, I'm uh, coming to you today from uh, Kitsilano in Vancouver, so from the traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish, uh, Tsleil-Waututh and uh, Musqueam First Nation, as well as traditional territory of the Tawasan First Nation. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about some work or kind of about uh, urban stream uh, restoration and, and some of the threats that urban streams are facing uh, here in the lower Fraser River, um, which is uh, kind of a little bit of the work that I do uh, with the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, um, and then also some work that I do just kind of on the side uh, as a as a streamkeeper uh, with the Still Creek uh, Streamkeepers here in Vancouver. Um, so I'm going to be uh, I I do a lot of work uh, here in the Lower Fraser River, so. Uh, the Lower Fraser River uh, is also home to uh, the Lower Mainland of British Columbia, um, and as you can see, you know from this image, uh, we have the the Fraser River running through the area, but uh, it's a very highly modified area um, with a, a lot of impacts on salmon habitat. Um, but despite that, the the Lower Fraser River uh, and estuary is is a you know incredibly productive uh, salmon ecosystem. Uh, it's home to uh, more than 42 uh, different species of fish. Uh, I think I've captured most of them throughout my uh, many years sampling in the river. Um, and it, it supports a, a huge amount of the overall production of uh, Chinook salmon, uh, you know, mostly coming from the, the Harrison River and Chilliwack River, uh, Chum salmon, uh, which mostly uh, only spawn in the, in the lower Fraser, um, and then a, a significant portion of uh, the coho and the pink salmon. Uh, and then a few significant sockeye stocks, uh, although most of the sockeye populations uh, tend to spawn a little further up in the Fraser River. And uh, just kind of touching on the, the salmon life cycle, uh, we know that there's uh, several components uh, of the freshwater aspect of their life cycle that are really important. So uh, we have adults spawning in freshwater, so they need to be able to access spawning areas. Uh, their eggs are then deposited in the gravel, uh, they need decent conditions to survive, you know, throughout the winter. Uh, and then juvenile salmon need to be able to uh, rear in freshwater environments. And some species like uh, coho, uh, some populations of Chinook, um, and uh, sockeye salmon spend, almost, spend a whole year in freshwater before they make it out to the ocean. So uh, these freshwater environments are, are really key to uh, the salmon life cycle. And unfortunately, uh, when you look at, um, you know, the, the lower Fraser River region, um, over time, we've seen this huge transformation from uh, an area that would have been just an amazing production system for, for salmon um, that was made up of, of wetlands and forests uh, to what we have today, which is uh, mostly uh, agricultural and, and urban areas. Um, and that wetland and forest uh, aspect uh, has really been re just reduced to a, a small sliver. Um, and some, some recent work by one of my colleagues on a paper that we're about to publish, um, he's, he's done some GIS work and shown that about 85% of the floodplain habitat in the lower Fraser is, is lost or, or isolated um, and, and close to that for the stream habitat as well. So uh, you can imagine that, you know, reducing the habitat down to 15% of what was historically there is uh, really going to reduce the productivity of those salmon populations. And when we talk about urban areas, uh, Vancouver is, is actually one of the worst areas for um, just completely losing a lot of the streams that once to uh, exist historically. So uh, all these red lines uh, running through Vancouver here, um, those are streams that once existed on the landscape uh, that are now, uh, you know, mostly relegated to uh, pipes uh, and they're they're part of the sewer system 
Um, but obviously if the stream is, is totally lost, uh, it's you know just taken completely out of that salmon production system. So um, you can see we have uh, Still Creek in Burnaby uh, there, and some other creeks uh, kind of in the Burnaby area, but uh, just a huge amount of, of stream habitat that's just been totally lost uh, here in, in Vancouver. And, and this is common uh, in Richmond and other areas of, of the lower mainland as well. And just again, kind of going to the satellite image, you can see, you know, with urbanization, we, we've really just uh, changed the landscape completely. So uh, a lot of those streams that have, are lost or uh, there's other problems associated with urbanization that they face. So um, as I mentioned, you know, this is a picture of, of a stream being pit, uh, kind of changed into a, a, a storm drain. Uh, this is back from, from 1910. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot of streams that still exist in the urban environments, um, but that are really less productive than they would have been historically. So uh, we have a lot of, of streams that are really uh, channelized. I, I've seen quite a few streams in the lower mainland where uh, the stream is channelized. The, the bottom is, is an artificial bottom, uh, you know, like in these photos here, uh, you can see there's kind of a rock wall that they've built on other side uh, leading up to the culvert. So, um, really channelized. Uh, a lot of the time, the, the riparian areas are completely lost. Um, and so you, you have a lot of impacts uh, on the, that habitat quality. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a lot of opportunity for, for bringing back uh, these urban streams. So um, this is the, the creek that I work on, uh, Still Creek. Um, and so uh, this is just something that I, I work on it. I'm in my spare time uh, as a volunteer. And um, one of the, the reasons that I got interested in Still Creek was because uh, I lived very close to it. It's, it's in East Vancouver, um, and, and there's a place by uh, Rupert Skytrain Station, which was basically the most urban place that uh, salmon were spawning in all of the lower mainland. So uh, they're spawning in this little channelized section of the creek uh, that's behind a Canadian tire beside a Skytrain, uh, you know, it's a swamp with blackberry bushes. Um, but, you know, there's still salmon that were making it up into that creek. And so uh, that got me pretty interested in, in working on the creek. And uh, there's a lot of other creeks like that throughout the lower mainland uh, where work has been done uh, to do something to, to uh, either restore access or restore habitat. And then you see the, those salmon coming back. And so uh, I'm just going to touch on a few kind of um, things that, that can be done to try to restore these, these urban streams. Um, so one thing that you can do uh, is you can join or, or start a stewardship group. So, um, you know, simple things that we do is just going out and uh, collecting garbage. You can see uh, in three of these photos that we're collecting garbage. Uh, we're doing some monitoring in the creek. So um, this is uh, one of the members of our group looking at a stickleback that we captured, uh, which is not very uh, exciting in other creeks, but uh, it was the first fish that we had captured in our creek uh, with our minnow traps. So um, we're happy to see it uh, in the uh, bottom right hand photo there you can see we've got a kids group out um, we've got somebody um, looking at the, the benthic invertebrates in the creek so you can look at uh, what invertebrates are in the creek and that gives you kind of an idea of the, the water quality in the creek so um, yeah joining a, a stewardship group is, is a really fun way uh, to get out uh, explore the environment you know get out into a, a, a creek um, and you can very quickly change your environment uh, when you're in the city and, and yeah, just help out. Uh, so along with that, uh, you know, there's some bigger things that we need to really do on the landscape to try to help these creeks out. So uh, a huge problem that we have with urban creeks uh, is something called impervious land cover. So uh, roofs of buildings, paved roads, uh, anything that, uh, that doesn't allow the water to get into the ground means that every time that it rains, uh, there's a huge amount of water that runs quickly down into the creek, uh, can kind of blow out the, the habitat or the substrate, uh, and it, it causes a really big problem. So uh, once you kind of have, you know, over a certain uh, ratio of impervious surfaces uh, in, a, in a watershed, uh, it really changes the whole hydrology of, of the creek. And so um, there's some simple things that, that can be done uh, to try to improve that a little bit. So um, you know, there's a big push for uh, just ways that you can capture water and, and slow it down and, and moving into the creek. So uh, you could have a, a green roof, um, you know, have more garden space and less, uh, you know, less paved roads. Um, you can have 
uh, these rain gardens. So in, in different areas in the lower mainland, um, you'll see these different rain gardens. If you uh, are in North Vancouver, they have quite a few running on Lonsdale Street and, and just different areas where uh, you're capturing the water, uh, allowing it to slowly move into the ground instead of uh, having it just run quickly off into the storm drain because uh, most storm drains lead to, to a creek eventually. And so, um, you know, encouraging uh, th these types of uh, adaptions. And then another huge problem that we have uh, with urban creeks uh, is invasive species. So um, I know people like to eat blackberries, but uh, they're actually like a huge problem. Uh, they're like incredibly uh, just taking over a, a lot of different urban creeks. Uh, once there's some disturbance in the area, the blackberries can really get in there. Um, and there's, and along with that, there's, there's other uh, invasive plant species uh, from knotweed to um, various other things that uh, can be a problem for, for these urban creeks. So getting in there, removing those invasive species and, and planting some uh, more of our local species. Uh, you can see the, the photo on the, um, the side where it's kind of just blackberry bushes. It's mostly bushy. It's not really providing anything for the creek. Um, whereas in the other photo, you can see we have some nice trees that are providing shade, cooling the water down. So uh, those types of things are, are really important for, for our local streams. Uh, and then uh, just lastly, um, I just wanted to kind of touch on, you know, the bigger picture for salmon. And so uh, it's great to, you know, go out into your local creek and, and um, you know, help out with a, a group and pick up garbage and do all those things. Um, but, you know, there's also really like the bigger picture for, for our salmon populations and, and a lot of that, uh, you know, you need to bring people together to, to come up with priorities and then really to try to focus on uh, getting government to uh, fund some different actions. So uh, these are just some workshops that uh, are some photos from some workshops that uh, Rain Coast has held just as kind of an example. Um, there used to be something called the Fraser River Estuary Management Program, which managed the lower Fraser River and Estuary. Uh, but that that went away. So, uh, you know, I think in the bigger picture, we really need, uh, you know, the federal government, the provincial government working together with municipalities, working with people uh, from NGOs, stream keepers, uh, working in partnership uh, with First Nations to to really first, you know, decide what we want on the landscape for for our streams and, and for our salmon, uh, put in those those stronger protections and then and then fund that kind of restoration work as well. And so, um, yeah, these are just some some of the uh, kind of things that came out of our, our workshop. So uh, protection and, and restoration, I think, is is kind of the key uh, the key for our, our salmon populations in the Lower Fraser and and for our, our local urban streams. And um, I'll just go ahead and uh, leave it there. Thank you, Dave. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. A little Thanks. time. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks you coming tonight. Um, I especially like. Um, how we're talking about urban stream uh, restoration. I think a lot of people live in, in urban areas and we don't feel like we're connected to nature and we don't know how we're able to, to take action uh, in our local communities. We kind of think, okay, so other people are doing that. Uh, but really it's about connecting with those local stewardship groups or if there isn't one, then creating those banding together uh, that's that's a way to take action there. Thank you for giving us the examples of the green roofs. They look beautiful too. Uh, the rain gardens and understanding why, why those are needed. Um, and not only that, but when people join these groups, it's it's a way to be social. It's uh, you have fun. It's, it's nice being outdoors, doing something that's helpful. Uh, but as you say, it's that first step is kind of connecting with those groups and then leveraging that community, those voices to then take action on a really high level. Oh, thank Absolutely. you, Dave. All right, we have our last guest speaker of the evening tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sadie Kern. Uh, Sadie is the program manager for Fraser uh, Riverkeeper, the Vancouver chapter of the Canadian charity Swim, Drink, Fish. Sadie is really dedicated to protecting waters for the generations to come to ensure a swimmable, drinkable, and fishable future for all Canadians. After completing her bachelor's in environmental science from McGill, she shared her knowledge and passion for conservation, public health, and water security through science education and communication with various organizations across the country. 
And Sadie is going to be talking to us a little bit about citizen science tonight and how we can get involved in that. Thank you, Sadie. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Here, I'll just get my presentation going here. So this is definitely going to be a little bit different from the other presentations that we've had tonight. I've learned so much and I'm really excited to share what we're all about. So I'd also like to recognize that the land where I live and work is located on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Since time immemorial, Indigenous peoples have been the stewards for the land and water. So at Swim Drink Fish, uh, I can see here on my shirt, we use citizen science and communications technology to ensure a swimmable, drinkable, and fishable future in BC. So my name is Sadie Caron, and I am the program manager of Fraser Riverkeeper. So we're the Vancouver-based subsidiary of the national charity Swim Drink Fish. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about citizen science and how we can use it to combat Canada's most common form of surface water pollution. And we can actually contribute some citizen science today. So many of you, I don't know, feel free to add in the chat. Have you ever seen any of these signs before? No swimming, boil water advisories, no fishing. Unfortunately, they're very common and it's because there are so many threats that impact the waters that we love and depend on for recreation, for drinking and for thriving wildlife. So basically at Swim Drink Fish, we're just trying to get rid of all of those, those lines through the circle. So you can see we're basically advocating for a swimmable, drinkable and fishable future where those red lines are removed, where all waters are safe for everyone. So today I'm talking a little bit about citizen science. Um, is there anyone who doesn't know what that is? Feel free to add in the chat. Um, it's also known as community science, so there's other terms for it, but it's basically the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public. So typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So anyone with any background can participate in citizen or community science. And if you're keen, you can actually participate and help protect our waters today. So <laughs> what I'm talking about is maybe not the most glamorous, but it is actually the most widespread form of surface water pollution that impacts the health of Canada's waters, uh, sewage. So there's actually several different ways, unfortunately, that sewage makes its way into our waters. So it could be through wildlife, you know, their waste could be entering the waters on rainy days in agriculture, that's unfortunately common, uh, storm drains, um, as well as what are antiquated uh, sewer systems. It was really neat to see in Dave's presentation, the people actually constructing these sewage systems, because if they knew what we knew today, I don't think that they would have built it the way that they did. So in Vancouver and many cities across the world, um, there are, uh, there's a system that we use. So there's basically three types of sewer pipes. There's sanitary pipes, so that transports sewage to the wastewater treatment plants. There are storm pipes, which transport precipitation into our waterways. And then there are combined pipes, which as the name suggests, transports both sewage and storm water in the same pipe. So this is actually a problem in Metro Vancouver because we're actually a very rainy area. And when there's significant precipitation, as you can see in this diagram here, instead of all that water in the pipe being transported to the wastewater treatment plant, it overflows into our waterways. So it overflows precipitation combined with raw sewage directly into our waters. Um, so basically to advocate for clean waters, we have to get, have a good understanding of this problem and how it impacts water quality throughout the year. So here you can see a map of where these combined sewer overflows have actually happened. So this was in 2017. Um, there were there was about 82.3 billion liters of untreated wastewater combined with precipitation dumped into Vancouver's waters. Um, and Vancouver has 39 known combined sewer outfall points that overflowed 3,000 622 times in 2017, releasing 39,060,422 cubic meters of effluent that year. So why is this a problem? Well, it's actually a problem for our wildlife. It's a problem also for public health because swimming in water that is polluted by bacteria, such as E. coli, which is present in sewage, 
can cause waterborne infections, including hepatitis, gastroenteritis, skin, wound, respiratory, and ear infections. Um, in Canada, a study looking at drinking and recreational water exposures among Canadians estimated that 400,000 people in our country get sick from contaminated waters. So how are we supposed to know if the waters that we're about to swim in pose a threat to our health and what can we do about it? Well, that's where our program comes in. So at Swim, Drink, Fish and Fraser Riverkeeper, we run a citizen science community-based water monitoring program. So the primary, the primary purpose of the program is the protection of public health from contaminated water and protecting our wildlife also from those contaminated waters. Um, the goal is also to um, prevent the spread of waterborne illnesses and making it really easy for people to know if their water is contaminated or not, or if it's clean for swimming. So we focus on sampling those well-used recreational hotspots. Um, right now we sample in False Creek where there's uh, paddlers, stand-up paddlers who often fall, kayakers who, you know, if you're like me or you're kayaking, you might splash yourself in the face every once in a while when you're paddling, and that might not be so good for your health if the waters are really high in E. coli. Um, and also there are some several uh, very adventurous individuals who will jump right into the waters of False Creek. So this program helps us collect data about water recreation use in, in False Creek, wildlife, high traffic areas, as well as information about the bacteria. So here's a map uh, in blue, we can see our sampling locations. And in orange, you can see where there are some known combined sewer outfalls. That's one of the reasons that we chose these regions, um, just so that we're a little bit aware, um, do these CSOs actually have a huge impact on, um, on our waters? And the citizen science component is that we have a team of volunteers who join our water monitoring coordinator at each location every week. Um, they're trained uh, to understand the threats um, to water quality and learn firsthand about how to collect meaningful data and how to advocate for targeted restoration efforts. So in 2019, the last time we were able to have plenty of volunteers, we were joined by over 100 volunteers uh, throughout the year to help us collect samples, uh, as, long as, as well as all sorts of environmental observations. So we collect data about how many recreational water users are out on the water, uh, the different types of wildlife that can be seen, tides, weather, floating garbage, um, as well as all the uh, basic water parameters. And so we've been really lucky in 2020 and 2021 to continue to have citizen scientists, just a very small group of them on a rotating basis. So we've had five sort of superstar volunteers who've, who've come out and joined us and we're continuing to just share what we're doing, um, but we're really excited for um, to be able to have more people join us um, once the regulations from the COVID-19 pandemic change. So then we take the samples to our in-house uh, microbiological IDEX laboratory on Granville Island. Um, and we use this system called Call Alert for testing E. coli levels. So we get results 24 hours after we sample them. And then we publish all of our results because we want the public to be really well aware of how much E. coli is in the water, is E. coli a good indicator of sewage? Um, what is the impact to the environment? And all sorts of things like that. So we're not the only water monitoring hub across Canada. Um, Swim, Drink, Fish hosts many different recreational water monitoring hubs. So we kind of have this model that we're trying to share with different people to get as many folks engaged in their watersheds as possible, where there's lots of recreation. So there's our program in False Creek, there's the North Saskatchewan River program in Edmonton. There's two programs on Lake Ontario in Toronto and Kingston. There's one on Lake Erie and Niagara and on the Jibasing First Nation on Lake Huron. And we've also launched our first external monitoring hub. So shout out to Pacific Spirit Park Society who collected samples at Rec Beach um, during the off season where Metro Vancouver doesn't collect samples. And then they brought uh, their samples to our lab where they were processed. So it's really, you know, we try to make it as simple as possible for people to learn about the whole procedure and you can, they, they basically just started up their own external hub. So all of their results, as well as all of our results, as well as all of the public uh, health uh, officials results, we share on this wonderful app and website. So somebody, maybe Paloma or Lainey could tap into the, the chat, swimguide.org feel free to visit because that's where you can see whether your 
local beach passed or failed its last water test. Um, so Swim Guide is basically a free app and website that helps you find your closest beaches, know at a glance whether it's safe for swimming, report pollution, so contribute to citizen science, and share your love of beaches with your friends and family. So Swim Guide is this has this amazing growing network of affiliates. I think we have over 100 affiliates now. They collect and upload water quality information so that anyone can access it for free. We're really big proponents of having open data that anyone can access and share. So when you open the app, it shows you the closest beaches to you and their water quality status. And then when you look on the beach pages, you can see the latest water quality results, who collected it, when it was collected, which standards they're following. There's all sorts of information about the data that you're seeing, but we try to make it really simple by kind of keeping a system uh, just with colors. And then once you get down to the water, there's also some information about amenities um, and usually a picture of, of the beach so you know what to expect. But you can also submit pollution reports directly from the website and app if you see something that concerns you. And that's really important because uh, if you're able to recognize pollution, that's kind of the first step in order to contributing really meaningful data and protecting your environment. And the second step is to report it. So that's something that you can do even today. If you have a photo of pollution that you've seen by the water, you can submit that and then we will share that with um, the local public health authorities and then we'll get this really incredible source of data. So this is basically what it looks like when I open the map, it shows me to the nearest beaches and you could basically see the most recent water quality results. Unfortunately, when I updated them today, I was like, oh no, there were a few fails. So we're gonna see some of the beaches that are gonna pop up red, um, which means that it failed to meet the water quality standards. So we, uh, we follow the same water quality standards in our monitoring program as Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health. Um, it's the guidelines for Canadian recreational water quality. So uh, we take uh, over five weeks. If the geometric mean of all of those samples means that there's 200 E. coli in 100 milliliters. If it's less than that, it passes. If it's more than that, it fails. And then in a single sample, if there's more than 400 E. coli per 100 milliliters, yeah, then it fails. So a green is a pass and a red is a fail. And then we have some other, oh, some other colors I'll show you in a sec. They, they, they're more longer term data. So for example, Kitsilano Beach, anyone been there before? I was just there yesterday swimming. I didn't realize that it failed, but I'm not feeling sick today. So I'm really, I'm really grateful. But uh, unfortunately, the sample that was taken on June 15th failed. Um, so I might wait. Uh, usually it's a good 48 hour rule after any heavy rainfall before visiting a beach because that's when there's often elevated levels of E. coli. But you can see that there's all sorts of information on the beach page, weather, amenities, photo, map, and water quality. And so here are some of the statuses. We've got current statuses and historical. So current is really simple. Green pass, red fail, and then gray, no data. And then you can see the historical statuses are actually more longer term. So that's what we see in the off season. So that way you can kind of get a more general idea about water quality, whether it's a, a beach that passes 95% of the time. So that's a lot. Um, yellow, it passes the majority of the time, 60 to 95, and then red has historically poor water quality. So it can also give us a little bit of a snapshot of what water quality is like. And then on top of providing information about your beloved beaches, you can also report pollution directly. There's a button there that you can click um, nice. to report pollution. I'm sorry, are we, are we okay for time? <laughs> There's Let's one write that out that we can report pollution. And yes, this I think this is the last slide here. Yes, it is. Um, and then the other place that you can report pollution is our newest uh, artificial intelligence tool, Gassy, the water monster. So if you visit gassy.swimdrinkfish.ca, you can also submit photos. It could be pollution, it could be wildlife, it could be water users. Uh, having photos is actually legal evidence of the history of water bodies. So it can be used in court to protect our waters. So even something as simple as a photo is something that you can contribute to be a citizen scientist and help protect your waters. So thank you so much. And I will thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sadie. Uh, the, uh, I know you had a, a few you wanted to show some signs of sewage. Uh, and that's something that we can we can also share share pictures of afterwards. Uh, I realize that we've kept you a little bit longer, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. We said we would end at six. Uh, we I'm going to tie up really quick. Anyone who wants to stay afterwards, we can have our Q&A session. 
I just want to say, Sadie, I'm so excited about citizen science. As a scientist myself, I love that um, anyone can contribute data, uh, get into science, and it's actually going somewhere. We're doing something with that data. It's, it's information that can feed into something actionable. And I also saw that the, um, the app that you shared with the map, that's actually global. There's, there's, uh, um, it's all over, so share it widely. It's not just relevant to Vancouver, it's relevant to wherever you are joining from or where, wherever you have friends and family too. Uh, just to summarize what we've been learning about tonight and our webinars at CSMART, we are solutions focused. We want people to take this knowledge and do something about it, take action. So please everyone, if you can, make a list from what you've learned tonight about things that you think are actionable that you'd like to adopt in your lives and make a bit of a plan. How are, what are the steps that you want to do to implement these? Because an action, sometimes a goal without, um, without a plan, sometimes doesn't go anywhere. So make a plan too. As uh, Dave was saying, connect with your local environmental stewardship groups. Uh, take a look at how you can get involved in citizen science. Um, Sadie was shared that gassy swim drink fish .ca, uh, app. You can submit photos there and also check out the swim guide. <clears throat> Letting you all know our final Clean Water Champions webinar is happening in three weeks on July 8th. Everyone here, please come and join us. The link will be in the chat in just a second. It is again at 5 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, we are really looking forward to this. And I hope you can all join us for that too. I'll also be sending out a post webinar survey after this. I'll also add in the chat. Uh, this helps us because we have funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada, and we want to report back to them. This is the impact our webinars are having. We are teaching people about freshwater issues. And we're hoping that people are taking action about of it. So think about the actions you want to take and answering our surveys are a really helpful way that you can help support CSMART. If you're looking for other ways you want to support what we do or a small education, environmental education charity, but we do so much. And if you want to help us, you can promote what we do, share our next webinar with your friends and family, sign up for a newsletter so you can stay posted on what we're doing. And um, if you really like what you came here and learned about, um, please consider becoming a donor or a monthly donor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're gonna have our Q&A after this. So uh, don't leave yet if you do want to hear a little bit more from our guest speakers. Uh, but for those of you who have to head out tonight, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Environment and Climate Change Canada for uh, supporting our Clean Water Webinar series and our school programs. Uh, Nada for being a promotional partner. All right, let's go to our Q&A. I know that we've had a few questions in the chat. So I'll kick us off by asking one. If, if other people, if you want to after this, unmute yourself or write them in the chat, I'll be reading them out. Um, Randall, this first question is from you, for you. Uh, Elaine was interested in knowing, do the different salmon species have different significance to Squamish Nation? And how do we say uh, salmon in the Squamish language? Uh, different names for, of course, uh, the salmon species that uh, frequent our respective territory from before contact. We, have, um, we actually have a reserve that was commissioned in the New Westminster. Uh, Fort Langley used to talk about when the fort was first built about our First Nations uh, ancestors, you know, thousands of canoes going by in the morning and hundreds of canoes going by lunch and still hundreds of canoes going by Fort Langley. Uh, and really that's when we were, we were going up into a war with one of the interior Salish tribes. Um, but the salmon species, you know, from the, from the smelts, ooligans, uh, uh, smelts, ooligans and, uh, uh, um, the forage fish, of course, and the salmon species, but um, with the with the names, there's various names of them. But of course, in our respective watersheds, you know, as I mentioned, um, the species have their own preferred spawning uh, gravel areas uh, in our respective watersheds. So, um, when we look at the um, the significance of the salmon, if I can, um, this is from a book, the Salish people. Uh, and there's something written in here. This was 1896. 
this was written by Hiltout. Um, in here, uh, in this book, he writes um, just a quick little um, thing he writes in here. Um, Hiltout, um, where is it? Um, Salmon. So this is page 50, and this is 1896 when he was speaking to elders of the day of the past, our ancestors in 1896. He said, the principal and staple food of the Squamish was salmon. These fre fresh in season and dried out uh, of season were to them what bread is to the European and rice to the Oriental. And great was the distress and famine if the salmon catch was poor. So when we talk about people like uh, Hiltel writing in the books and talking about our ancestors of the past, we've had species almost um, and are at risk right now. And that's why we worked hard on, this, on the Chinook salmon and the Ilahu Valley, removing that rock. Because now again, we've seen um, anglers who've caught five-year-olds and four-year-old uh, spring salmon going up towards the Ilahu Valley. We've also worked with the foot fish hatchery and, we re and when we opened up that rock and removed it all, blasted out, it was a lot of work, but we released 5,000 fry that end of that season. Uh, and the next year we released 10,000 Chinook fry up there, but we found evidence of coho, five-year-olds and four-year-old cohos go ahead. And these are huge pieces of salmon going up there. And, and, and it's really exciting. They, they can now access 23 plus uh, kilometers of pristine habitat that was cut off. They got by there at certain times of um, water levels, but now they have unfettered access up there. So, so with regards to the salmon, uh, we, we, as we appreciate, as I mentioned, we're 16 clans or tribes uh, and we have 16 different dialects of saying the salmon and, and uh, coast is one of the things we say for salmon, but also tai e, is also for the king salmon and various uh, names for each species. But each watershed, we uh, harvested all of them. They're all significant to us. But of course, the chum salmon, the dog salmon were preferred because they were much oilier and they're the preferred smoking salmon for the winter. Uh, and the preferred uh, salmon was, was the chum salmon for the smoking purposes, but they were all very significantly important to us. Thank you, Randall, for sharing. Yeah. That's really uh, all, all new knowledge for me, and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to invite anyone um, of our participants tonight, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question. I would just like to comment on Dave's uh, comments that uh, we could, we did some, I did some habitat restoration of riparian uh, on a Mosquito Creek, and we put a large of uh, natural large uh, boulders and witty uh, and, and large witty debris in there. Um, so that we completed that a while ago. Well, 2014, there was a major slide in the Seymour uh, watershed and the, we, the nation participated on, on getting the funding and doing a lot of that work uh, uh, and removal of that, that, that major impediment that was uh, on, on the Seymour. We've also done a lot of work. I created a partnership in the past working with British Columbia Institute Institute of Technology our students. We did a lot of work on the McKay and restoring the McKay Creek, also Lynn Creek. Um, so uh, we've done, uh, but also on the Seymour two other areas because our Squamish Nation Seymour office is, is right on the Seymour River uh, uh, on the dike berm there. So, um, and I appreciate the work you've done on uh, Still Creek uh, because that's what Gold Associates office is. I did a lot of work uh, with Gold Associates and heard in the news in the paper of the day, the work you guys done on Still Creek, and that's great job well done with regards to getting salmon species up there again, because they hadn't been there in a long time, but job well done. Yeah, well, and a lot of that was uh, the city put in, or Metro put in a new fish ladder on the, the Caribou Dam there at Burnaby Lake. So mm -hmm. again, that's what uh, allowed them, the chum to start making their way back up there. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of good actual spawning habitat up there. So I think it's mostly uh, just from the chum fry releases that, that were, those fish are coming back. But Right. Thanks. Um, if you'd like, if, if anyone else would like to ask a question, please pop it in the chat. Uh, we do have another question for Sadie. Uh, in terms of that map, um, there are some beaches that where they're very close together. So the example given was second and third beach in Stanley Park. 
one of them was safe to drink at, uh, to swim at, but the other one wasn't. Why does that happen in such close proximity? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. And there's not one single simple answer, <laughs> but basically that water changes like the weather, you know, and just, just like it can be sunny one minute and then 20 minutes later, it can be pouring rain, even at beaches that close. Um, the, the sampling that is being conducted is by Vancouver Coastal Health and Metro Vancouver. And so, you know, they sample at one place and then the next place, it could change that quickly. Um, so it could be the currents, it could be maybe there's an outfall somewhere, whether it's a stormwater or combined water outfall, there's, yeah, there's lots of different reasons. That's a great question. And just following up from that, there was a bit of a part two, which is what would happen if we do swim in them and we're, it's advised against that? It's, it's statistically, you're way more likely to get sick. Um, so the ways that you can get sick are usually if you get it in your mouth, your eyes or your ears. So that's why oftentimes when you sample, you sample at the levels where people would start to be splashing in the water, especially kids are usually more at risk um, because they're probably a little less cautious about ingesting water. Thanks and Sadie, last question for you here uh, from Michael. Um, he's going to be circumnavigating Richmond's 80 kilometer um, or 80 kilometers along Richmond this weekend by robot, a rowboat. <laughs> uh, do you need any samples? Is that something that people can just go and contribute to wherever they are? That's such a wonderful question. It, it, it does help if you do preliminary samples and then sample for a longer term time. So that's sort of what we're focusing on doing is getting like a longer term picture. But thank you so much for the offer and that we definitely can um, understand things when we, we do sort of those spot samples. But uh, usually it's something that we've researched for a while and targeted. So thank you so much for the offer. And if it's something that you're, you do quite often, maybe we can chat and explore. Yeah, if you need to reach me, my email's sadie at swimdrinkfish.ca. I'll we'll throw that in the chat. Thank you, Sadie. Uh, that's the uh, end of our q and uh, We're going to end the recording here. I wanna give one final thank you to our uh, guest speakers tonight, Randall Lewis, Sadie Karen, and Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being here with us.